Volleyball Podcast, where we learn everything we can about playing and coaching beach volleyball. You're always welcome to visit our website, betteratbeach.com, where we have a number of ways for you to get better. We have online training programs for every skill, where we take you step-by-step -step through tutorials and drills so you can fix your passing, setting, arm swing mechanics, attacking, serving, defense, and blocking. And we also have a 60-day max vertical leap program. So if you're interested in workouts that will help you increase your vertical jump, you can go ahead and check that out. We also provide online coaching and mentorship from real professional athletes and coaches. And this is a perfect place for people who want the coach to take their game to the next level. We'd love to see you at any one of our seven day training vacations uh, where you can hang out with pros and get over 40 hours of training in one week at beautiful beach resorts around the world. And you can always reach out to us if you wanna bring us to your hometown to run a one day clinic for any of your local players or coaches. As always, please support your sport by subscribing to our podcast and any volleyball or beach volleyball podcast. If you can, if you like the episode, leave us a five-star review and go ahead and share this episode with the volleyball players and coaches in your life. On to today's episode. Today, we have a very special guest who is actually another college coach, which I'm very excited to talk to a college coach because the, the area, the environment that you get into when you talk from number one, juniors, it's its own universe when we talk about juniors. And then kind of the, the typical adult experience where we have weekend tournaments uh, and recreational play, but we're still trying to get better. That is a crazy different experience than juniors or college. And the professional experience is entirely different. And in some ways, worse than a lot of people's college experience with sports because of maybe the lack of funding, lack of resources, lack of leadership and direction. I'm not sure. But Gretchen's got, oh, well, I, 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 I spoiled it. That's her name. <laughs> Gretchen Hand has a ton of experience. She played on the AVP. She played pro. Uh, she is now a college coach for Missouri State Beach Volleyball. And we're going to dive into her experience and try to glean the differences and see what the pluses and minuses are for players at each level and in each kind of little beach volleyball universe. So I'm super excited to have her on and I can't wait to hear about her experience and learn a lot from her. So without further ado, Gretchen Hand, welcome to the show. Hi guys, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to uh, geek out with you about beach volleyball. Let's do it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so uh, what we always ask guests is, what did you do today? So you're currently uh, Missouri State Beach Volleyball head coach. What was today like? And today is May 5th, happy Cinco de Mayo, 2022. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Today we have been celebrating just of our end of season review. This is where we get to meet with student athletes and kind of go over, this is this is where we are at and this is how we're gonna to continue to improve and really develop fully, um, both as an individual student athlete and as a program. So it's all fun and great feedback of like how to get that future growth. Mm. How long do those meetings last? So you pull each individual in and you just say, this is where I think you have to get. This is where we are right now. Uh, I, what, how long does that meeting last? And and what's the most uncomfortable that you've ever been in one of those meetings? <laughs> well, I think that it's um, it's never meant to be a bad discussion. Like if um, whenever you do a review, there's we should always be able to call it that a uh, find the positives, right? So, um, and then there's always going to be, I never want to be a know-it-all uh, as a coach or a player. So there's always going to be areas to improve and being open to learning is really, really important. As a first year coach to Missouri State University, one of the biggest things is just to get to know my kids. And mm -hmm. we had a, a wonderful roster of student athletes that gave their very best this year. And we had learning curves this year that were incredible. And I became a better coach for my student athletes and my student athletes became better athletes all, all, all the way around. 
So it's a win-win. I think uh, one of the biggest things after COVID is just kind of learning how to chat and how to discuss face-to-face again uh, after being, uh, I'm thankful for this podcast, but mm-hmm. it's different whenever you're face-to-face, you know? And, 100%. And so 100%. to have that um, human connection and being able to meet with coaches who care, we want to show that first and foremost, we, we care about our student athletes. So, And it was pretty easy during that time to feel really like alone, disconnected. I, I lucky and lucky enough to have like a pretty awesome wife. Yeah. You know, so I, we got to play, we were peppering out in front of my house, like every day working out together. And then we went on a bunch of road trips when they locked everybody in. We're like, lock in can technically mean lock in your car. Right. So we went out on these big road trips, <laughs> but if you don't have that, that partnership, that friendship, um, or, you know, somebody's at home working or, you know, the nightmares of it where it's like you don't like your home environment. The COVID could have been a terrible, terrible time for a lot of people. And getting back out of that where you can just be around, you can change environments um, and and be around some better people. I imagine, I imagine a lot of people are getting this uh, breath of fresh air uh, in Absolutely. terms of seeing people in person. I think we have a lot of families still recovering and that's okay. And it's okay not to be okay. And we've had those uh, communications with, I mean, colleagues, student athletes, you name it. It's okay to check in on each other and have a different dialogue and not just brush off the dust and act as if everything's okay. Um, I think that for the next few years, we're still going to see families struggling financially and learning how to, uh, recover from that. And we want to be there for all of our student athletes and colleagues and our friends and uh, any way that we can support. So uh, today was a day of review and how we can do better, um, both on the court, off the court, um, academically, and how we can have more fun over the summertime to get really excited about our fall time. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Right now, just because I kind of want to dive into, pretend I'm diving into one of those player meetings. So I want you, in in your mind, pick pick one player in your head. And, of course, we don't need to or want to say your name. But what was one piece of advice that you gave to her to get better? You know, what was one tangible thing that, that you gave her during one of the meetings today or yesterday? Um, I, I got it. Okay, so... Uh, Without naming names, we had a student athlete that uh, was asked to do multiple roles, whether it was split blocking or being a role of a defender. Um, And that student athlete um, had a tremendous outlook and just really kept a positive attitude. And yet, whenever you're going back and forth between the roles, um, I think one of the hardest things is to be patient uh, with yourself. And um, I know that that's one of my own personal downfalls everything that we wanted, we wanted it yesterday. So um, <laughs> as an underclassman, uh, Missouri State Beach Volleyball, we were, we were very young this season. And a lot of them as underclassmen did a great job and it takes time. And so that is something where you can't put a finger on it of just like, yeah, I'm gonna give myself this. Um, and sometimes it's asking uh, your student athletes and your athletes just to have faith and faith in in the process. Um, and so across the board, I know that we're doing great things and uh, and yet it still takes time. It, it's never gonna be a perfect game. Mm-hmm. And uh, like you have sets and matches that are like, wow, I was really on, that was awesome. Like fire, straight fire. <laughs> um, and then there are times when you're like, wow, I just got hit literally in the face and it's humbling. and. Mm-hmm. We celebrate that joy in the wide range, uh, and I think it's important to just let it be that in that moment, and then be patient with it. And that's that patience is something huge, and I remember being in college, and somebody way smarter than me talked about the progression of years in college. You yeah, know, I was I was really impatient with with the skills, and I think a lot of people are really impatient with not developing. They want to know when when's the time that i'm going to be this level of efficiency and it's it's hard to really measure that we had a few drills in college where you knew 
hey, if I beat this drill, I'm at the level where I need to be. You know, and that was a big a, a plus or minus side out drill where it's just you against an entire team of six. And can we set you and can you can you side out, you know, to, yeah. and play a little game of tug of war where you get seven points, a seven point lead, essentially. And it was uh, horrifically <laughs> taxing the conditioning drill. But the first time you win plus seven minus seven, you're like, yeah, yes. this is me yes. being a baller, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that th those are the character builders and uh, you kind of have to be okay with earning your way in and, yes. uh, and really learning how to enjoy that process. Because um, if you're constantly just try to get to the next step and get to the next step, while it's great to be passionate and driven, we're supposed to have fun along the way. And that is, that is where um, if we're not enjoying the process, we can actually stunt our own growth. Mm -hmm. So we want to find joy in the process. We want to be patient and like really um, it, we try to journal every day at the end of our practices just to kind of right. like set it back in stone and review it in our heads of, okay, this is what we did a great job with today. And um, so it, for any athletes out there, like, what did you do a great job with today? And it could be anywhere from I planned out my day to doing meal prep and had great nutrition to I got enough sleep. I, I put down my phone. I, I got enough sleep for went to bed early. So we really try to talk about all the disciplines that can make us more efficient on the court. And while it's skills and drills, yeah, it's mm -hmm. also about the disciplines off the court that will set you up for success. Yeah. It's so funny that the – when you said like the go and put your phone down and go to sleep thing. Yeah. When I was in college, we had texting. We didn't, I don't know, think we had smartphones yet. I, I don't quite remember, but there was still a significant amount of texting and we had laptops. So you're still like, that was when, you know, on Facebook, you're just DMing everybody. That was our mm -hmm. smartphone texting. And it's, it's strangely important and difficult to say, I'm going to put my phone down now because otherwise it's going to cost me this much sleep. And, and I think a lot of people, myself included, will watch something or, start, or text or communicate or just swipe through reels or whatever until they feel like they're so tired that they can't continue. You know, instead of choosing to go to bed so that you have maximal performance, it's yeah. strange that your body is willing to sacrifice uh, that time down the road you know, and that your mind yeah. doesn't say, no, I have to shut it down. I have to put the phone in another room. I have to close it so that I can get my sleep because your body or your brain at that point doesn't know that you want to wake up in four or five hours. Or well, six, and eight. <laughs> yeah, to, to piggyback off of that. So you have these student athletes that are physically still developing. I, I think about your college years of how your body changes and muscle development. And that's for both males and females. And so mm -hmm. um, whenever we talk about a controllable, that's a controllable. You can control if you are uh, letting your body wind down and turning off that phone or creating a new uh, system so you can have more recovery time to be more efficient on the court. That um, absolutely, uh, as a freshman and sophomore in college, it, it gets a little different whenever you're a junior and senior because of the number of repetitions you've had. And longevity wise, if you start practicing those disciplines earlier, um, it can lead to a stronger, healthier career even beyond that collegiate level yes stronger healthier it's not talked about enough that the lack of sleep will cost you an injury and an injury will create a new motor pattern and that motor pattern just because you want to get back into sports so quickly you might ignore full recovery you yeah. might get back to the point where you can play, but do you actually get your body back to the point where it was pre-injury? And I know personally, that's that's why I went through a lot of that. It was I would I found the minimum amount of recovery time, and then I just said I'm good enough to play. And you kind of forget about the little rehab to get that section of your body back to 100%, so that your body operates again at 100%. But yeah. if you lose sleep, you lose nutrition, you start getting hurt. Then hurt is where you build compensations on compensations, and then you just keep this cycle of it's getting those hurt dominoes. Those dominoes it. keep going for sure. 
Yeah, that's wild. That's wild. Um, and and I just going back to the the path of how fast people should get better. I remember that the the college coach what he told me, and this was uh, Paul Concer. He I don't know where he's coaching right now. I should shoot him a text. He's always like making his way around the the, the NCAA coaching rounds. Um, but he said, "Listen, Mark, you're being in, too impatient with yourself." And I was like, "Well, whatever, you know." But he said, "Year one is when you're just looking at everything and you're learning what a tool does, because you're not even learning how to use it yet. You're just looking around and saying, ah, that's a hammer and it puts nails in. Uh, that's duct tape, okay, it sticks things together. He goes, year two, the entire year two is you being able to now use it. Okay, let's, let's teach you how to actually be efficient with a hammer. And you might only <laughs> learn a couple of them in that second year because it takes a lot to be a master with each tool. And then he says, finally, you're three, four, five, depending on how long you've been in the game. That's when he goes, you have your tool belt. You see a problem and you don't even need to look for it. You just grab it from your tool belt and you, you know that that's the solution to that problem. And that really calmed me down when he somehow, I guess metaphorically or theoretically, broke it into years of where I should be mentally, you know, yeah, that pathway for success. And I think that, um, that that was a great way to break it down. And we talk about our resources as well. And whether it's those proper tools and the progression. Um, but I, I think that whenever we look at um, beach volleyball, it's so incredible to see how quickly these uh, student athletes are coming in as impact players. And you're seeing it right now on so many levels of, it, it's not necessarily if you're a senior or graduate student, it, you're seeing anywhere from freshmen all the way up com competing on the court in great ways. And so again, uh, it, it may not be a, a year thing. It, it may be that your maturity uh, it's, it's a different pathway. So that mm -hmm. patience, it's really important that every year is different and that we recognize that maybe your first two years when you were on and it was fire, it was easy. And then there could be, could have been an injury or there's, there's some other life change that makes it a different kind of season. And so it's really important yeah. just to be a constant learner and okay with making adjustments as you need it. That's so so smart just to say like hey if your path might change it might get altered you might you know zig when you should have zagged or zig when you're supposed yeah. to zag but you have to be a constant learner which means when you're presented with a new situation a new environment hey this isn't an interruption this is our opportunity now to adapt and overcome and see like what's next because life's gonna throw always a million problems at you. <laughs> we can problem solve now i mean my goodness like our goal and what we want to do is to help our student athletes go out and be successful young adults in the professional world and be uh, in, uh, incredible influencers in many many platforms um and i'm confident that you know this class that's uh coming off of covid they're fighters. I mean, they didn't quit even when there was a global pandemic. So mm -hmm. for any student athlete out there that is struggling, like you've already made it through so much. You just got to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, as a coach, do you ever throw intentional wrenches for your team or for a player? Or do you kind of let life handle that? I did this one thing uh, when I was coaching. I was the player coach in Sweden for one of my pro teams. And uh, I locked them out for an intentional uh, 25 minutes before a practice just and you know i was going to use it as a uh, as a teaching point like what's going to happen if we show up to a match and we need to play immediately you know how are we going to react in that situation that's going to be a problem we're going to run into uh to teach my u15s uh, I, i'd coach a girls club team to teach them honestly it was a it was a thing about drinking i had them hold something in their hands while trying to play a volleyball and literally a two-hour one-handed not not one-handed practice but they had to hold something in their hand and i said this is what this can do to you just know that 
you will be handicapped if you make the decision to drink. And at no point did I say, don't drink, don't drink. Like you, blah, blah. I said, this is what comes with your decisions. There's an inability to do certain things. Can you work around it? Did you figure out how to pass because you could put your other hand on top of it? Yes. Is it compromising you incredibly? Yes. You know, so we, we, but they didn't know what I was teaching them until the end of the practice when they were so pissed off. <laughs> and I think that um, it's, it's important to use different modes of learning and it's, it's anything that's thought provoking at this point. Uh, beach volleyball is such an ever changing sport that uh, we call it. Um, that's, that's our chicken. I, uh, I coach with uh, Coach Carlos Jimenez with Web at Weber International University, and being from Colombia, the, the, he was literally playing on a court one time, and a chicken ran across, and they went had to go pick up the chicken. And that the the idea behind it is that you're never going to let anything rattle you. Uh, you're going to play your game, no matter if a chicken's on the court or not. So we call it that's our chicken, and I think it's I just important. That. It's important just to know that any challenge that's thrown our way, that we are absolutely going to overcome any adversity as if it was supposed to happen that way, because mm -hmm. beach volleyball is random. Yeah. As if it was supposed to happen that way. Yeah. That's gold. We're right, right where we need to be. Yep. Treat problems as if they were supposed to happen. Yeah. Oh, man. A round of applause <laughs> for that one. I like that. That might be our hook. <laughs> yeah, right on. Um, okay. So uh, we talk a lot about problem solving. So I want to know what you think mentally are the two most important attributes. And yeah, I might end up pressuring you into a more detailed answer. Usually people don't get it on the first try, but something tangible. Like what is, what is the two, what, sorry, what are the two most important attributes mentally? for a successful beach volleyball player? Well, um, on the court, to create the most success, I, I feel like you're either 50% of the solution or you're 50% of the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And every single uh, rally, we want to be solution-based, meaning that um, whenever it comes to having a teammate that uh, I find, and this year was uh, super, super helpful. Uh, coach Carol Welcher, our assistant coach, we like, we used to play together and she, we were lucky enough to have her assistance this year. And um, one of the best points that was really effective is, and as we were teaming up, we were like, our, our athletes weren't looking each other in the eyes. And so Whenever hmm. after rallies, it's just like, okay, look at each other and let's talk about what we need real quick. Like, like, was that a great set? Okay. We're going to give that visual of like, Hey, that was a great set. And like start to make that better connection with our, with our teammates. And I think that that is again, after COVID um, something that's kind of been lost is just really making sure that we're connecting with our teammates on the court and asking how we can help each other. So it's, um, we want to be solution-based and be there for each other. Um, and I think that that is different for every student athlete of what they, they need for success. So does problem solving mean 50% uh, of the problem solver? Is that positivity? Is that just a, instead of, instead of turning uh, emotional, a logical, how do we fix this problem or yeah. so going back over the the resources um we, we or the or the tools that we previously had talked about the tool belt <laughs> and uh we talk about on uh when we're on serve receive making sure that we have a great side out game well if we have a really aggressive server that's pushing us deep did we adjust uh, with the proper footwork? Did we reset a little bit deeper? Did we take that if if we got challenged in a on the back left corner? Did we take that serve away and shift our serve receive? There's so many different resources that we could have used. We could have switched our left and right side, but we're going to exhaust all of our resources and make sure that we are making as many adjustments to make it difficult for that for our opponents to do it again 
back mm -hmm. to us. Um, I think it's important to remain flexible. Um, and that's just a small example, but like knowing our resources to overcome the adversity, we really try to break down each, um, each area to say, hey, here's some uh, prob problem solving solutions or just ways to overcome it quicker. Um, and I, I feel like it helps them for in system play. How do you think that that compares with being, you know, having the rock of what your system is? So if you're always problem solving or you have the ability to lean or, or dip or dodge in a different way, as opposed to let's do what we do every single day, or is doing what you do every single day problem solving? Are you more like chameleon based if you had to summon a spirit animal? <laughs> I think that um, whenever we look at the schedule of life, right, it, it's, it's ever changing. And so it's really important um, and at relating it back to season. So we get into season and we go straight in and everybody's super excited and they're fresh and they're healthy. And then you get to mid season and all of a sudden the academic workload gets a little bit heavier. You're starting to see more stress management needed mm. and like athletes may be getting a little bit more phys physically um, showing uh, the need for more recovery time. Um, and, and then towards the end of season, like that's when you're seeing all of it. Like you're seeing the physical injuries that may have uh, been coming out. Um, it's the academic workload. It, it could be any number of things that are um, ever changing. And so our practices, while we have core foundational work, um, it, it is meant to help them and deal with the stress management at hand. So we do our two week progressions for our practice schedules, but we stay pretty flexible if, if needed for the needs of our student athletes. If, if we're coming back from a road trip uh, and they're super banged up, we may just be doing yoga for that first day mm. back and working on, okay, we're gonna hydrate, we're gonna get our, um, with our athletic trainer and get that recovery in, and we're doing yoga today. Um, mm. It just is need based. Yeah, I, I I like being flexible. I found that it's important to me. Uh, I didn't used to be that way, and then yeah, I, I see this one Instagram reel over and over uh, with Kobe Bryant, who was mm -hmm. like, you know, I made a contract with myself. I made a promise to myself, and he's like, if you're if you're too tired on one day, if you can't do it on one day, he goes, nope, that was you know, I'm not changing because this is what I said I would set out to do. And it's always like, where is that line of doing it, no matter what you are, where you're tired, when you're hurt, when there are problems and, and other things and other stressors going in your life? And, and can you just keep beating your head against the wall and eventually, you know, you're going to break that wall down? Or do you shift and ebb and flow? And then if it's somewhere in the middle, which most likely that's where the answer is, where do you find that line? Well, and I love um, that mentality of having that discipline and things changed after COVID and like our student athletes need a little bit more assistance and our colleagues need more assistance and um, just mental health and wellness. We have to be aware that it's important to, to listen to the need. Um, it's no longer just about the skills. And mm -hmm. so whenever you see um, when we talk about stress management and what that looks like, um, it's a, it's a wide range of need going on right now. Um, it's really hard to pass a ball when you didn't sleep the night before because you're stressed out about all these tests because of the workloads. And that's when you're most probable, like your highest probability for injury, whenever you're that fatigued out. And, and mm. so I just, um, uh, I have definitely over the years become more aware of the needs of the student athletes. Um, it is important to have structure and going through the, that core foundational work and having your progressions. And yet there's always time to care and, and listen to the need of the student athlete. Do you think foundationally that 
athletes everywhere, especially high school and college athletes have come out severely weakened from COVID. Um, yeah, I think just... that, yeah, that first year back after COVID, you saw a ton of, um, uh, catastrophic injuries that were, were not normal. Like it just wasn't normal. Like our season right after COVID, um, I was at a previous institution and, uh, I was working with both indoor and beach and on the indoor side, basically you had a season that stopped and, mm -hmm. and, and then we started it again for the following spring. And so you had a lot of impact injuries, ankles, knees, hips, um, even shoulders of like, just not having the normal reps of attacking. Um, so I think that um, we're much better than right after COVID, but I don't feel like we're out of the woods yet. I think we're still kind of, um, you have to continuously monitor those student athletes and the ones who kind of started right before COVID that got a, a year delay. Those are the ones that were the most susceptible at that yeah. point. Um, so I think it's just important to be aware and monitor um, and, and then try to establish that new norm uh, for, okay, what's our standard of, of getting our core work in. Yeah. Yeah. And how do, how do we get back and how fast do we get back? Because it's, I mean, it's widely known, like uh, uh, COVID increased obesity rates quickly, uh, increased levels of depression quickly, uh, increased suicides quickly, all terrible things that are going to have consequences, not only just currently, but down the road. And it was a complete awful thing. You know, it's, it's not as awful as the people who suffered the worst and suffered real family losses and the people who lost their lives from COVID. But we have to find a way to, you can't just hit the ground running again. And right. I think a lot of people tried to do that maybe um, for, for us, you know, like, yeah, I got my stomach got fluffier <laughs> than it ever did, but I, I also have a gym in my garage, you yeah. know, so I built my own access point and thank God, I, you yeah. know, I, I ha I'm lucky enough to have space where I can have a squat rack to work out because it's so weird to just sit there and do jump squats like in your living room. In our online program, we have a, a 68 vertical leap program. People literally, they bought their interchangeable dumbbells and, and we designed the program so that you could do it with any equipment. But they were literally doing weighted jump squats in their living rooms and they still saw those those vertical increases, but it took a lot of pushing them to get them moving. It took a lot of people together in one group showing like in our Facebook group, we, we give a lot of support. So it's, Hey, I'm doing it. Why aren't you doing it? Hey, that person's doing it in their dining room. I, yeah. all right. I guess if they're doing it in their dining room, I could do it on my porch. That's not so bad. Uh, but when you don't have those connected groups, you lose, you just lose out because you think, Oh, well, it's not easy for everybody probably. So I'm, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, fight or flight, right. Of, are you going to fight for it? Or are you, are you going to like just hunker down and try to protect yourself? And there was a wide range of, um, of response, uh, during that time. And I think that even from your caretakers or whether it's your parents or your loved ones, everyone's response, we were just trying to do the best that we could. So, um, for our student athletes, even now, it's just like anytime flu season comes around this year, it was, it was scary again. And so there was a fear of like, Hey, is season going to get canceled? And it's at that point, it's just reassuring that while that fear is real, like we're, we're not going to feed into it because it's out of our control and we're going to focus on what we can control. So, uh, we were able to get through a great season and those, those student athletes, we were able to reassure them. And I understand that fear. And yet it's, um, sometimes it's when it's out of your control, you just have to have faith. It's going to work out. Yeah. I like that. It's that the fear that's bugging me right now is everybody's now the fear of all germs, of people, of groups, yeah. of 
groups are the most important thing in human society. Like there's no, there's, there's no lone wolf that successfully survived. No man is an Island. You cannot survive on an Island on your own. It, right. You need groups and the fear that has been generated now from groups, from people connecting, um, from just the world and your environment, man, I hope it goes away quick, but you can still you know, walk around and, and see the people who are really, really still like walking the earth very very fearful and it's i feel personally like bad for them like i want to help them and say like it's it's okay but you're also talking to somebody who like doesn't use soap or shampoo when they shower and is totally fine with going two or three days without it and, yeah, <laughs> and like washing your hands to me there. is against health rules like, <laughs> i think there's a, a range there of just like um as it relates to our sport it we play a dirty sport. It's out on a beach, and and, and it's important to know that uh, um, that a lot of it is it is out of our control. But do what you can with what you have. And so, if we are in our garage getting a great workout, that's what we have in that moment, and to celebrate that moment. And uh, for our student athletes, whenever we were kind of going through it, the season of like just seeing the Omicron variant going through, um, you know, it, that we couldn't control if we were going to get shut down or not, but we went to work and we didn't live in fear. We had fun and we got yeah. better. So I think that if it's an outside element that you can't control, um, we're going to put it on the side and focus on what you can. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm having trouble with like the specifically for me, this is probably off topic, but uh, the, the hand washing and the Purell and hand sanitization that, that just w went rampant all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the studies and I did a deep dive into these studies, I go, this kind of doesn't make sense because you know growing up i was like hmm they said in the army you never wash your hands you know like you you want to expose your body to to different things without like letting it completely take over and now i'm looking at all of these skin documentaries they're saying like every time you take a purell an alcohol wipe you're killing your body's layers of germs that are meant to to keep the other guys out like your skin is porous but it develops a little biome so that you can't let things in or they do their job and like you every time you clean and wipe your hands and destroy that like you're wiping all of those away it is important for doctors whose hands are going into other people's bodies and like getting through that but a, a lot of these things that are coming out that i'm seeing every day are flying in the face of the whole like hand washing thing where you're saying like, you, you're actually kind of destroying your skin's own ability to to fight things away and uh, seeing, ev I have never accepted the the little uh, alcohol wipe from the airline agent. I'm like, N no, like I'm not putting my hands in anybody else's body or mouth. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think it's it's very thought provoking, and um, whenever as it relates to our collegiate and student athlete level, that that's something that is just we have our athletic trainers and we talk about um the, the hygiene and and mm. the the newest of like alignment with cdc so um because we're an institution it's it's a little bit different than just um training out like a, on at a professional level um, sure. so it's uh as, as of right now we we do recommend and we stay with our athletic trainer for the latest advice and man even this year it changed multiple times so right. i think it's important like anything that we we remain flexible uh so we can have the best outcome and you have to you have to go with the best information you have available to you currently and you know the people who are yelling at everybody else um they've seen different information sets than you have yeah so they're going to have a, a different opinion. It's just, it, it's a little bit sucky that information comes from a million different sources right now. And yeah. in I general, that, it's tough uh, to understand where it's going. Yeah, and, and locally, it's just different. Uh, how it is in California is different than Missouri, which is different than Florida. And it's uh, coast to coast, it, it's, it's not uh, a crisp, uh, 
consistent across the board just yet, but I think we're, again, it's important to like remain flexible and um, it, it's to the need of that area. I think that's a brilliant point because they are, yeah, New York City versus upstate yeah. New York versus somewhere in rural Oklahoma. Like you're having one person at the top generate rules that are supposed to blanket the entire thing. And it's like, but yeah, yeah, everybody's in a different situation. And that's not just for, you know, this, this COVID thing, but that's uh, for a lot of things in, in policy and everything. So hmm, that's, that's a very smart and interesting point that it's tough to apply all those different rules. I guess that's why we have governors and mayors so that they can have some freedom within there. Yeah. Anyway, back to volleyball. Um, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. All right, so we went to, to the basically uh, most important mental attribute that you noted was problem solving and then being the positive force on your team. And I think some people, just as a warning, some people think that they're being a positive force by yelling at somebody else or telling somebody else that they're doing something wrong. Uh, that is That can be a version, but I think the positive force will always play play to people's strengths better if you can be neutral with your speech or positive do you have we have a problem with this at camps and our classes where you have a somewhat more experienced player or somebody who just heard what the coach said and they see another player doing it incorrectly you know like partner coaching and i always get to stop them i go hey guess what everybody you guys all have the day off and they get confused and i go none of you have to coach today because you <laughs> hired me to do it you know and this is like real tough with husband wife boyfriend girlfriend where i'm doing a private lesson for the two of them and it's like their couple date and one of them you can just see the pressure that they're putting on the other one and it's like hey um i'm gonna try to do it uh just this way so can you just let me work in here a little bit and uh, and i'll try to try to see if i can get through it my way and that's tough those yeah. matters. So do you, do you allow or encourage coaching with, within teammates or how do you, how do you mitigate or promote that? I, well, I think it's always important to support that line of communication. We want to bring out each other's best and how we communicate with each other on the court is kind of like, what do you need? How, how can I help? And so um, it, just for, for basics, if it's a serve receive drill and we're working on that first ball contact uh, for that transition set, like where can we put that set uh, for our attacker that's going to be the most efficient? So um, working on that feedback and working on the communication of like, hey, um, we're always going to be giving some type of feedback. So whether it's the type of serve that's coming at us, uh, giving, uh, if it's a close ball, if it's gonna be an out call, making sure that we give enough time for our teammates to make that response. Um, and then uh, for the set of like set location and giving feedback after it's complete of like, hey, that was a great set. Mm -hmm. So we can give that positive reinforcement to our teammates to make sure that we can produce it more consistently. So. I think that um, as it relates to coaching, uh, we have a great coaching staff with a lot of knowledge. So uh, if it's if it's a, a movement that needs to be corrected, that's one thing uh, that the coaches are happy to help with. But yeah. if if it's feedback on how do we help each other uh, make it easier for each other to do their job, we want to encourage them on how to communicate and give that feedback. Like if the pass is too tight and it's becoming a, a trap on the net, we we want the setter to, to give feedback of, hey, let's pull that ball off just a couple ball space. Give me a little room to work. Really? There. You would say that after that? That's when I tell them, I call that a uh, no SHIT comment. I, like when you see a passer pass literally into the net and the setter hits the net while setting and they say, you got to pass that off. To me, it's like, no shit. <laughs> like yeah duh. <laughs> but and but sometimes like especially like with with newer programs or newer learners sometimes they don't realize that the pass looked great and then all of a sudden you had wind on your back and the ball blew uh two more ball spaces uh it started out great and it was a higher pass and maybe the wind took it and mm. we just 
it, it could be that we need to talk about the elements at that point. But just um, if, if there is some open dialogue that can help our uh, play become a little easier, we want to support each other in that. I've just always found that when you, um, after we'll, we'll call it no crap. I don't know who's listening or if I'm allowed <laughs> to curse on my own podcast, but uh, we'll call it like the no crap comment. Uh, like when you, when you set somebody tight and the blocker literally like grabs at the same time as the hitter and the hitter goes, set me off, dude. Yeah. No kidding. Like, <laughs> Why, yeah. why are you even saying that at this point? And I found that that when you give that feedback after that mistake, where it's an obvious mistake, and then you say, correct it, I found that that shuts down communication more than anything. And instead, you, I, at least at my level, I know that they know that that's tight. And mm -hmm. I'll say, hey, I'll fix it. But yeah, perfect for me is four feet. I don't yeah. say set me off, uh, set me off. That was too tight. I don't accuse their last action. I say, yeah. what's perfect for me? And for yeah. me, four feet from the net is my perfect set. And so that that's how I'll interpret it. I go, you can't set me tight, man. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. I'll fix it, but four feet's perfect for me. Yeah, and I would say, well, if, if we can't set each other tight, well, was it the pass? Was it the pass that was too tight in the first place? So we really try to break down the movements of the why. Mm -hmm. And um, we're not going to, our goal is not to have the same thing happen twice. Yeah. So we're going to be constant learners on the court. If we had a, an outcome, then, okay, well, let's pass um, to a new location. Maybe let's run a back play and, and run a different or a different tempo set. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always a solution that we don't have to repeat that same action unless it's the outcome that we want. Hmm. Fun. Huh. I yeah. kind of like that. Yeah. Because yeah. like uh, Tetris. Yeah. Uh, well, with with me, I, I think I do that. I, I go to that after two or three fails. Yeah. If I if everything was good and I just made some kind of mistake, I go, give me that same ball again. I'm going to fix that now. Yeah. Because I need I need to establish this yeah. and then I'll, I'll go and, and do the other things. And I think defensively getting to recognize the really macho dudes on the other side of the court who get stopped one way, mm -hmm. they usually back down quickly and they go the complete opposite way. So if we stuff somebody down the line, they're either going to hit hard cross or they're going to shoot the next ball, you know, whereas I think. A lot of people go, no, I'm going to go back to that because I know that that's my good swing. So yeah. I need to have that good swing as, as part of the statistical set here to keep the defense honest. And absolutely, you can reinforce that and, and have that confidence. But And I would say that there's probably something just to have that confidence. You still made an unknown adjustment, right? Mm. like to, to create that outcome. That's and so that's point, yeah. And so that's what we're trying to um, get them to, to recognize, okay, it doesn't have to be big, but like, we're going to, we're not going to give that same ball, the same experience. We're going to make a slight adjustment to get the outcome that we want. And you can absolutely, if you can crank online, do it. And, but if, if we made an error, uh, on, on, on a ball down the line, um, I want you to go back after it, but what's the adjustment? Is it keeping your body neutral so we're not over rotating? If if we hit the ball out uh, wide a little bit, there's there's usually some kind of adjustment that can be made to get the outcome that you want. That's a fantastic counter. It's yeah. we're making adjustments, but you know if if yeah. I got stuffed going cross, maybe it's because I went too low, or maybe it's just because I turned. You can still go hard cross. You can still have the same swing, just an alteration of how you did it. You just stay higher next time. You know. Um, Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Nice job. You should be in debate class. <laughs> <laughs> Not debating. We actually are we're, uh, agreed pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and we whittled <laughs> it down to a perfect answer. Yeah. yeah. Good teamwork. Um, okay. So next then, what do you think as a player? Because you played pro. Did, did you ever play pro indoor I apologize for not. Knowing I did not. No, I, um, when I finished, I finished my, um, uh, athletic career with university of Missouri, St. Louis. Um, and I, uh, before when I graduated there, there was no beach volleyball. I was 
in the middle of the country and beach volleyball was not at the college level at that time. Um, but I didn't want to be finished. And I had a very, uh, my dear friend, uh, Kelly Renee Hickam, she's now Finney. Uh, she was my first teammate out of St. Louis, Missouri. We teamed up for about seven years total. Um, we were brave enough to start in St. Louis, Missouri. We played the EVPs, the Jose Cuervos, the King yes. of the Beach, like you name it. We were, we just wanted to play. And so we traveled Midwest based for quite some time. And then we were brave and we pursued our dreams and we moved out to California. And that's when we got into the AVPs and traveling internationally and just really, um, we were blessed. Sometimes you'd rather be lucky than good, uh, but a nice balance of both helps. So um, we were able to compete for quite some time. And uh, now uh, I was out in California competing and uh, I had many, many pathways of that got brought me to this point. So what do you, what do you think was like at that time when you're making that move, you're going from Midwest, now you're going to AVP and now you're progressing AVP. What were you disappointed in that took you, you think, too long to learn? You know, where you just wish you would have picked that up or you wish somebody would have just given you that easy answer that you just spent too long figuring it out. Did you have any of those? Sure. I, I, I think, um, especially for all those athletes in the Midwest, like for so long, especially when I was going through my beach career, mm -hmm. um, it was the, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. There's no beaches in Missouri. Like you shouldn't do that. You should go and you should get like um, the can'ts, the won'ts, the don'ts. So you want to eliminate that negative talk that doesn't apply. So I would say if you have a dream and you want to go and pursue whatever it is to, to go for it and to be brave, I, I had to overcome a lot of fear uh, of just like fail, failure of like, oh, well, what if I move out to California and it's not what I thought? Hmm. Wherever you go, there you are. And you're supposed to be there in that moment. So I would encourage like student athletes to be brave and go for it. Um, I'm excited for beach volleyball where it's growing for both the women's side and the men's side and our pro side. And there's room enough for everyone. So if you want to do it, you should go out and do it and quiet the can'ts, the won'ts, the don'ts. Hmm. So you think that the, the, the slowest, the thing that slowed you down the most was the, the hesitation to actually yeah. go out and be in a volleyball environment, you know, and volleyball environments now are getting bigger. They're bigger, becoming yeah. a lot more pockets where you can still be successful. That still might mean, Hey, it's four hours from your home instead yeah. of across the country. Like I know, um, Right next to you guys now, there's this big, beautiful facility, Beach Volleyball uh, yeah. Ozark, and they've got 10 indoor courts in this gigantic bubble. And that, when I walked into it, we ran a clinic there. And mm -hmm. when I walked into it, I said, This is what I want. You know, I, I looked at it as like, You guys did what yeah. I want to have. And it's such a beautiful place. But now they built that without having an environment or a culture already established, which is a little bit wacky to me. Um, because in Utah, for example, the guy in Salt Lake City, Corey Merrill, who owns that facility, he ran leagues in a park for two years and they were all sold out. They didn't have enough courts. So he was able to go to a bank and be like, look, here's the size of my waiting list. Here's, I can't get enough people in. So this is why I want to build this and here's the financials. And so he, he built the community before he built the facility and now uh now beach volleyball ozark they're like kevin costner and they're they're just building it and yeah, they're not hoping that people are going to come they are grabbing people and saying yeah. come here come here come here getting corporates getting uh people to come in and run clinics and for for our clinic we had somebody who drove 16 hours literally he drove 16 hours to get there because it's a, it's a nine hour clinic we, we we go ham uh with, with our training days but that's how you build it. And I think people have to continue to understand that a community, whatever you want for a, a sport like beach volleyball or anything else, you have to have an active hand in building your own community. And that takes effort, yeah. but you don't have, I don't think you have to have to have to go out to California anymore. I just think right. it's, 
easier because there are so it, many players out there. What's what's so beautiful about our sport is that it's every area is different, right? So the California style of play and that investment of time, it's just like it's where your legacies are at because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's been developed for so long there. And then when you go to Florida and it's South Florida play, it's a melting pot of culture. And it's yeah. so cool to see the Brazilian influence, to see like all these outside uh, various cultures that come into the South Florida style play um, and the different tempos. And then the Midwest, I feel yeah. like that physicality. The small ball of Florida. The, the Florida small ball, the slow yeah. handsets, the slow, yeah, yeah, low ball. Yeah, It's so, you can I see a Florida player just by like how they play. It's, and it's, it's so funny. It's, Everywhere you go, there's these different tendencies that you can pick up on. And I, I'm so thankful that I've been able to travel and meet the amazing beach players that we have because everybody contributes a different type of influence and style. And it really can help you be an active learner for life if, if you're just open to it. So travel and play and, and get to know different coaches. Um, I feel like the more coaches that you can surround yourself with, that knowledge is power. Um, and, and for where the Midwest is growing to, we are creating that opportunity that most did not previously have. When the Savara family with the Volleyball Beach Ozark, they're passionate and they they did build it and people are coming in from all over and um, the Springfield area, they are building it. We're building more courts um, and the Midwest will become a powerhouse in a great way and a different yes. way. It doesn't have to be like West coast or East coast. We it's okay to be different. So mm-hmm. I'm excited where we're growing to. Yeah. And you know, they, they can become something. If you recruit the right people to your team, you can become sort of like what, um, I, I always compare things to the indoor club in, in Illinois sports performance mm-hmm. where they really Illinois had no business being a hotbed for recruiting as far as volleyball, but one club and then a few other clubs that started around it just said, we have a systematic approach. We know how to run a club. We know how to coach our coaches and our coach coach our way. And it's, it's, it's a very you know progressive system when you get into their club and they built now a whole environment that when you hear about players from Illinois, okay, now I'm interested in going there to recruit. And I think that's what the Savara family is, is doing as well. They're going to see that, you know what, there's a 10 court facility there and there's nothing else to do in Missouri. So if they're playing beach volleyball, I bet they're doing it yeah. 10 hours a day, you know? <laughs> and Well, and it's an investment, any, any, it's investment of time, it's investment of money. And I think that if you want to practice your craft and become the best at it, then you have to be willing to sacrifice what it takes to get the outcome that you want. So mm-hmm. a lot of times our student athletes will say, I want to earn a competition team spot. Okay, and let's let's create that pathway. What does that look like, and and what areas do we need to improve, and how can we get you on that pathway? The quickest is by we do have to sacrifice during season our social life. We like that's just making it a priority. We do have to. Uh, it's not even have to. We get to because the 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 get to is um, man like it's not everybody gets this opportunity. We get yeah. to do this together and it's, it's fun um, to see that investment grow. And it, it bugs me when somebody wants that other spot yeah, and they show up to the practices and then while doing the same amount of practice as somebody else, they're there in the gym for the same amount of hours. They're there for the same lifts and they don't put in the outside film time they don't stay after their practice and jump serve for however long. They don't come 30, 40 minutes before practice and then, you know, uh, serve and pass and dig against a wall. It's like when you show up to practice, if you're a part of a team, you are currently doing the bare minimum to be on the team. You're not doing the maximum to have a starting role. Yeah. It, it's the, the extra repetitions and time. 
I think 99% of athletes don't understand. And that's why the 1% will always, you know, trump them athletically and skillfully. And I think that as it relates to like that college experience that that's uniquely different than, than club, um, mm-hmm. like whenever you're going into your college years and you're transitioning into the disciplines, it's not about mom and dad staying on you to do your work. You do have to become more self-motivated and time management is real. And so like to max out your abilities on the court, it does take um, that I am putting my phone down. I'm going to bed early. I'm going to get up early, complete homework, like make sure my nutrition, my meals are ready to go. I'm going to every single class and I'm going to outperform in both academics and on court. And I'm going to be an outstanding citizen. So it's, it's connecting the dots. Uh, Success is not a fluke. It's not a fluke whatsoever. And so if you are, if you can figure out how to be successful in the classroom, it's going to help you be successful on the court. It's going to help you be successful in your profession after the next step. So right now we are learning how to connect the dots for the success. And there are tremendous commonalities that will work for each individual and as a program. Okay. While, while you were saying that my mind started going towards it, Lift like being prepared outside work, and then I, I thought two two and three years before that, for myself, I started lifting when I was fourteen. I I, I mean for sure I was doing push ups, sprints, agility, but I started lifting my freshman year, um, and that was on top of now all of the like little agility drills that I was doing on my own in middle school, and. So I was equipped in the weight room. I already knew how to power lift I, uh, an Olympic lift by the time I got to college. I literally, the word that I want to use is going to sound mean, but I'm embarrassed for people who show up to a division one program or scholarship program and have never lifted, have never put the weight room. I used to say, you, if you're going to get a division one scholarship, you should have to have some sort of measurement of, of hours logged in a weight room, because I saw specifically it, from for, from being a guy in a division one volleyball program and seeing how much went into it and, and and how hard we worked and then we saw a lot of uh people on the on the women's team where there was 12 scholarships and they're giving them away the type of athlete that was getting this scholarship was just so low and you know that they haven't touched a weight they haven't been in a weight room and that was admitted and i was like how can you get to a division one program and never put in the work in the weight room and never said, I need to get stronger and faster. I was, I'm always embarrassed for the people who are, who don't, haven't put in that little extra time, but are somehow gifted uh, a, a scholarship. And, and do you, do you take that into account when you're recruiting players? Like, do you have any experience in the weight room? Does it bother you when a player does or doesn't? And I know that like, personally, I, I get think- fired up about it, but yeah, I think it's concerning um, because you want to make sure that your student athlete is coming in prepared to take competition and and, and be ready to go to um, the strong the the stronger that you can have your body be ready to perform. Um, it's gonna as an individual and as a program, it's gonna make all of us better. So um, we definitely um, are proactive with making sure that yeah we're where we are including the strength and conditioning. We have a strength and conditioning coach on staff and athletic mm-hmm. trainer on staff that the student athletes can um, help develop their programs. But also we do additional uh, speed agility training and footwork. Um, there's just so many opportunities for growth, right? And so I, I think just energy wise <clears throat> by promoting it and and knowing that it's a value and voicing that before those student athletes even come in, that they know that they are going to be doing those workouts, that they're a little bit more proactive. Um, I think it's a little bit different as well. I, I think that um, I'm sure it does still happen, but I, I don't know too many of my incoming recruits that aren't not because I'm forcing to forcing them to, they, they do it on their own. They, they are God. already self-motivated. Yeah. And so, like overall health and wellness is so um, 
it's it's so much there's there's so much availability now um, mm-hmm. that back in our days that previous student athletes just didn't have those resources. For the players who, uh, and I see this on juniors, I never knew it was a thing, but juniors will take their senior season off and they won't play or they won't put in. And this is coming from club coaches and and close personal friends who go, I can't stand coaching 17s because they're checked out. They don't put in effort because either they have their D1 scholarship or they have their school already and they claim that they don't want to get hurt or they or they're already set or they don't have that and they're so demotivated at that point. Um, and then the third athlete is the one who didn't care uh, to, to move up a level in the first place. So they don't have that growth mindset. As a coach who, who spends time recruiting players to your program, are you disgusted like I would be at people who would take off their, their junior or senior year before they get to your program? Or are you like, thank God I'm preserving my financial investment for my program? I, I think that um, every, every coach is different, but for, for me, I want my student athlete to be healthy and in shape and ready to come in and be high impact um, for, for any program. And, and so um, that doesn't even really register in my mind of taking a year off because we already saw what COVID did to us by taking a year (laughs) off. And to me, I, I want my student athlete to have the disciplines and the physicality that it's gonna take to help build a powerhouse. And so if it's not reflective of that, then that's not our plan. We talk about our pathways for success and like even the, the recruits of, of what they're currently doing, again, that it, that's just not even an option um, that they're taking off that time. Um, it's time to go to work and it's time to have that work means many categories. It's like, okay, the stress management work, where's your recovery at, your hydration, your nutrition, where is your on-court work, where's your academic work? And it's it's not, uh, oh, I have to, we get to, man. And like, not everybody gets a D1 scholarship. Not, not everyone gets a scholarship. Yeah. And at any level to play college ball, oh, like that is an honor. And there's so many different pathways to get to compete now. Um, to me, if I'm a, a student athlete in high school, uh, I would say go after it and earn what you want. Like there's a spot for you to compete, um, but you have to earn it. It's not given. Why do you think that's happening then? Why do you think, uh, well, I, I do have two questions before I forget it. I want to say, uh, you don't have to answer this one yet, but I'll say it out loud so we don't forget. Uh, number one, do you have the power uh, to remove somebody's scholarship if you get a report of them just essentially taking mentally off while still being a part of their club team. Um, and the second is, why is this happening? Why are there so many players that uh, they, they think that they're done once they've gotten their college scholarship? I just think it's mindset. I think that um, it's it's not about earning a a spot on the the college roster anymore. That's not the end result. Like, I think that that used to be the end result of like, Hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to earn a scholarship. And that for whatever reason was the stopping point. And like, once they earned it, maybe at that point, that's where they thought that it was complete, but that's actually just a new starting point. And that new starting point is like, okay, we've, we've earned a position into college competition. That's great. Now my next stepping stone is going to be earning a competition spot in the top one through five. Um, or my next stepping stone is, okay, I just graduated from college with my undergraduate degree and I want to pursue a professional level. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now what's your pathway for mapping out the tournaments you're going to focus on? So to me, there's always a new starting point. And we're not meant to be finished until we're six feet under, man. Like I just, <laughs> I want to keep improving. I want to keep challenging. And, and um, I think that the, that mindset growth, growth mindset um, 
if you can be forward thinking of like, okay, this is just the very next step of really cool stuff and yeah. get excited and be motivated about that fun opportunity, keep challenging yourself because the end result is no longer, oh, I'm going to get to play collegiate beach. That should just be another starting point. And now there's new disciplines that have to be implemented. That's awesome. My, uh, one of my best friends, uh, Pat Santiago, who just got the head coach job at Columbia, he talks about like, once you hear that you can, you got accepted to a college or you got a spot on a college team, he goes, now's not the time to let off the, ex like the no. throttle. He goes, now's when you floor it. He goes, yeah. all right, we're going now it's full throttle. And, and every like new thing, it goes, you have to push the accelerator harder. You really do. And I don't think people are, are willing to say like, you know, you're building your engine along the way so that it has the ability to to push harder. You're building your work capacity. You're building your tolerance for, for pain and your time management skills uh, to be able to have more room in the accelerator. But at each new level you reach, you are pushing the accelerator down another inch. And along the way, it's like you've got your foot on the accelerator and you're working on your engine at the exact same time so that it will move faster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that um, it's okay not to be comfortable. And that's part of that learning process. And when we're getting challenged and we're learning, <clears throat> it, it's not a narrow progression up, up, up. Sometimes you're going, woo, and it's a, it's a, the scenic route, but either way, um, like, to have that patience and, and faith, you know, tying it back in, it's like, just like keep grinding out. Um, that's part of the adventure and the fun. And then all of a sudden you reach a new high level of like, I didn't know I was capable. Well, now you do. So now what? Mm -hmm. and, and, and looking forward to the new challenge. Um, and I think that that's part of why I love beach volleyball. I love coaching it is because it's never the same. It's because there's always new, uh, teammates, new athletes that I'm working with, and it, it's there's always a way to help. So, yeah. yeah, new emotions, new problems. There's so much nuance to the game, to coaching, um, and like you said, you're you're experiencing as a college coach now, like coming out of COVID. This is you have an entirely new set of problems to deal with that no one else has ever figured out before. Yeah. And you got to figure out how to do that and, you know, surround yourself with a team and get advice from people and try to soak in as, as much of the best information as you can and then move forward with it. Yeah. And I'm thankful that we, we get to, right. So like we could be doing something else. And instead I, I truly believe that beach volleyball is the greatest sport out there. I, I truly believe that the the lifestyle sport, the the friends, the family, the relationships that you build can last a, a, an entire lifetime. And I have had more love and joy in my life because of this sport. And mm -hmm. I'm thankful that I can, am in, I'm in a position I can give back to my community. And we, we really try to uh, have uh, fun in the process of just like, where, where is this adventure going? And just take in those moments. I think, I think beach is so magic as a lifestyle sport because you can show up anywhere and within the span of a vacation, you can make friends that you could hang out with for multiple hours. And then even after the playtime, you continue to hang out with them. Like you go to a beach resort and you try to find people to connect to, but beach volleyball players, we wave a flag saying like, we are beach volleyball, come join us, you know? And you, yeah. you already know that you have a built-in family as soon as you get to a new city uh, on vacation or for a short amount of time. It's not frequent, or if you like, if you say like, I'm a baseball or I'm a softball player, uh, that you can just go to a resort or go to a new city and find a walk-up softball game that yeah. you could get next on. You know, um, we have we have a really special sport in that way. I think tennis is is similar to walk up to a court and just randomly find a pickup game uh, basketball. But sometimes basketball is just a little bit brutal s socially. Um. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think one of the greatest compliments um, that I had from a student athlete, uh, like through the connections that we had made over the years is, is like, coach, I know I can go play anywhere in the world and I have a friend. 
And, and I, I think that that is if the way that we now can connect our sport anywhere in the world. And man, what a beautiful thought. So I, I, um, I love the competition. I, but I also love the relationships that the, that you can build over the years and it just keeps getting better and better. So yeah. Brandon makes exactly that speech at like every one of our camps. He goes, every single camp, we come in as strangers and we leave as family. You know, you're able to call anyone from any one of our camps that you met there and be like, hey, I got a work trip for two days in Chicago. Is anybody playing? And the people on our Facebook group, they'll just jump onto it be like, blah, blah, you could stay here. You could stay here. We have people now who met at our camps that are just literally staying at each other's houses around the country and playing together. And it's so cool. To it's see so how cool. those connections yeah. Yeah. and they help you in so many other areas in life like once Absolutely. you you build that first bridge through sport then all of a sudden you can you can turn that into other stuff you know I, i've met through volleyball i've met people who have made me much better in business or in real estate and we've now i've partnered with three different people who i met through beach volleyball in real estate deals and it's like yeah. cool you know <laughs> that was the bridge that we love and we know we have this common bond and now we can figure out what other ways we can to, to succeed together. Yeah. So it's a magic sport, man. Magic Agreed. sport. Yeah. Well, Gretchen, I don't want to hold you too long and um, I'm not, I mean, even halfway through the things with me that I want to <laughs> talk about. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if we could do this again uh, together at another point, maybe of as course. you're kind of deeper into your, into your off season and maybe recruiting during the summer yeah. and see how it's going. Absolutely. So is there anything so that much. you want to, that you want to um, say or share? We have your links. We have the link to your, uh, in the show notes, you'll see the links to uh, Gretchen's coaching profile, the Missouri state bears uh, beach volleyball squad and, uh, and her Instagram, which is uh, coach Gretchen hand. Are you doing anything with that Instagram? Is that just a great place to reach out to you in case somebody have questions? You know, I am not the most um, social media savvy. I'm, I'm learning and I'm improving. I, uh, if you reach out to me on Instagram or you send me an email, I, I, I try to uh, get back with urgency. I just um, getting out of season. I'm playing catch up for sure on my emails and Instagram accounts. So uh, if you're a student athlete reaching out to Missouri State University Beach Volleyball, we look forward to speaking with you when it's uh, when we're able to um, and allowed by the per NCAA. Um, but as far as where we are growing to, Missouri State University has fully invested in beach volleyball and we're so excited to see us grow in the very, uh, in the years to come. Yeah. So I'm excited you for so you. Yeah. Can't wait to see uh, Missouri become a new volleyball hotbed, which it seems like it's en route uh, with That's new good. facilities, a program. It's got a great coach in charge and yeah. Uh, and the, I think you guys are building some more courts by, by the airport, which is crazy. You guys are going to have 25 courts within like 30 miles or something. It's been an incredible year. Um, the city of Springfield, we had our first ever gun serving hoses and that was the police versus the firefighters. On, <laughs> uh, it, it was awesome. And they were, the firefighters were straight fire and the police officers, they were, they were not messing around. They were very serious. And next next year, we're going to open it up to a statewide. And in year three, we're going national, baby. So everybody will be welcome, all of our first responders. Um, it's an incredible uh, community event. But we've been so well-received and loved in the community. Um, we are growing our sports. The city is helping with putting in more community sp uh, courts for bigger venue events. So we're excited. We got a lot of great things happening. So you'll hear hopefully some more wonderful stuff here in the near future. Great. That's awesome. Gun serving hoses. <laughs> I love it. I got two brothers on the FDNY team uh, yeah. in New York. And so they yeah. go to the World Police and Fire Games every couple of years. And they, they do throw that match. But I think you got to title it better like you guys do. Gun serving hoses is beautiful. <laughs> we, th there was there was a, a trophy involved and, and a lot of bragging rights. Uh, the fire department took it near one. So they... Uh, of course. Now That's what we do. Firefighters, have baby. The, have that honor. Yeah. They, <laughs> Man, it, 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 it was uh, elbows. Elbows were yeah. being thrown for sure. So. I mean, we don't sit in cars. We scale buildings, firefighters. 
<laughs> just, oh, I man. love always service people, but my family's FDNY, so I got to be on awesome. the firefighter side. Well, thank you so much for having me on, and uh, I'd love to talk to talk again in the future. Thank you, guys. Thanks, yeah. Gretchen. Have a great day, and we'll see you on the sand. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.